Hello, welcome to Italics, the Italian-American magazine. I'm your host, Lucia Grillo. Dean Anthony Tamburi is on assignment in Perugia, Italy, till June. First, on this episode of Italics, we will go to the National Italian-American Foundation's annual East Coast Gala. Based in Washington, D.C., NIAF, or the National Italian-American Foundation, is the nation's primary voice lobbying for issues of interest to the Italian-American community. NIAF recently held its annual East Coast Gala in New York City at Cipriani 42nd Street. The gala celebration brought out a large crowd from the community, joining luminaries from all walks of life, including business, politics, entertainment, and academia. Journalist Maria Bartiromo and Academy Award nominee, actor-playwright Chaz Palmintieri, among other notables, were honored by the Foundation for their contributions and achievements. Later on Italics, we'll join the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition at the 101st Annual Commemoration of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. The Coalition announced the creation of a Triangle Fire Open Museum and the progress of the permanent memorial dedicated to the Triangle Fire. Now let's go to Cipriani in New York City and NIAF's East Coast Gala. We're at the National Italian American Foundation's annual East Coast Gala at the legendary Cipriani, 42nd Street in New York City. We'll show you highlights from this evening's event, interview some of the guests, and the evening's honorees. Tonight, we have a chance for Italian Americans in all fields to come together and not only celebrate our heritage, but take a moment to recognize the accomplishments of some very special members of the Italian American family. Each of tonight's honorees provides us with shining examples of the enduring Italian spirit. I've never left America in my life until 24. And uh, I'm going to Tokyo. Get, getting ready to land in Tokyo, uh, they give me a landing card. And it's got all these easy questions, name, address, whatnot. It gets down, nationality. And I put Italian. I go up to the immigration officer. He's Japanese, of course. And I hand him the card. Okay. And I hand him the passport. And he looks, and he looks at me and goes, uh, American? And I said, yeah. He goes, uh, Italian? I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> looks at me and goes, no. I said, yeah. <laughs> so this, of course, would have went on forever. Until the guy behind me taps me on the shoulder. He says, pal, <clears throat> your grandparents were Italian. You're an American, and the rest of us would like to get into the country. <laughs> and it's actually the first time in my life I realized I was an Italian-American. <laughs> I often uh, discuss my heritage when I talk about uh, my career because I do attribute much of my success, all of my success, to my upbringing. And I think today we are looking for uh, stability and there's so much uncertainty in the economy and an honest media, an, an, an honest and independent media is so critical and important. So I'm grateful to have found something that I love. So I thank you tonight for your support for your friendship. I will cherish this. Thank you so much. My parents believed that in the United States, education was the great equalizer, along with hard work. And that education was not a luxury, but rather a necessity. My parents were right. Education opened doors and created wonderful career opportunities for me over the last 33 years. I'm especially pleased to accept this award tonight from the National Italian American Foundation and I am absolutely, truly humbled to be receiving this honor. I've always been extremely proud of my Italian-American heritage, but I don't often think about how it relates to my work. And this evening's recognition has changed that. I view tonight's recognition as a challenge, a call to be ever mindful of my responsibility to share the gift of education. When I was a young actor, and I was living in the Bronx. My mother and father lived above me, and then I finally got enough 
I put money to have the apartment underneath them. And I was uh, uh, trying to make it as an actor in New York, and I was working as, as a bouncer in a nightclub, and I would come home really late, and I was running out of money, so I would write on a little index card. I would write, Dear Mom, Dad, could you lend me $20 and slip it under the door so I wouldn't wake them. And the next day, I would see under my door, $20. So this went on for maybe about five or six months that I needed money. And then cut to 25 years later, I get nominated for Academy Award and my career is exploding. And I told my mom and dad that I wanted them to walk down the red carpet with me. We're in the limo and, I, and my father looks at me and he says, should we give it to him now? And my mother says, yeah, give it to him now. So my father reaches into his pocket and takes out a, a, an envelope and he hands it to me. He said, we saved this for you. And I take the envelope and I look at it and I see all these index cards. <laughs> he said, me and your mother saved those cards because we knew this day would come. <laughs> so, so I tell you all out there, to do what my mom and dad did to me, instill confidence in your child, no matter what he wants to do. You stand behind them, because the world is tough enough. They don't need their parents to say, to say, no, you can't do that. And whatever we can do for education, all the wonderful things that NIAF does for education, whatever you can do with your own children, with your grandchildren, and like my father Lorenzo Palminteri used to say, there's only two kinds of people in the world the givers and the takers. He said, the takers eat better, but the givers sleep better. We have to find ways, we have to find reasons for us to unite all of our voices and to work together so that we make sure that Italian American is not a phrase from the history books of this great nation, but a phrase from every present. And that every collective ethnicity out there can look to us and what we've done in so short a time, I think this is very, very important. Why is it always important for us to continue to celebrate our Italian heritage? Mosaic is a lot of different fragments, different colors, different shapes. And in the harmonizing of them by bringing them together, you get real beauty. And we're a very big piece of that mosaic when we are at our best. I'm very active in the Italian American community and I MC a lot of things and I like to participate in celebrating Italian Americans because I do believe that any success that I've had in my professional career is largely due to my upbringing and who I am. Italian American actors, it's, it's often difficult to find work that are not in the stereotypes. How did you manage to defy that? I, I write my own. That's how I do it. I write a lot of my own stuff. And, you know, the higher up you get, the less you have to bend. And the more you could switch things, you know. If you're playing a lawyer or a judge, I always go, why can't, let's make him an Italian-American. We have some great people that are Italian-American. So I think it's important that we mention that. It's so incredible to be here. Of course, New York is my hometown, and I am of Italian-American culture. My father was born in Rome, and, you know, there's such a supportive crowd here tonight. I'm honored to be here performing. When I was on American Idol, I wanted to make my Italian culture proud. And I'm just so thrilled to be here tonight, and I appreciate all the support that everyone here especially has given me. Next on Italics, we'll join the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition at the 101st Annual Commemoration of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire.
of 146 men and women who died 101 years ago in a fire that should never have happened. The best way to honor the past is to work for a just and more humane society now and in the years to come is what animates our effort to build a permanent memorial for the Triangle Fire right here at the very place where the fire happened. Thank you. Remember, the Triangle Fire Coalition has been working on this project since before last year's centennial, and we have made great progress. Labor art is being removed, and there is almost nothing in public space that speaks to immigrant rights issues or to women's issues. Look around you in New York, there's almost nothing. This weekend, we are entering a new phase of the Memorial Project. We are launching the design competition on the director of our coordinator, Ernesto Martinez, and I invite you to join with us in this effort. A century ago, safe workplaces were not a given. They had to be fought for. Unbelievably, today, safe workplaces still have to be fought for in this country and around the world. My union represents workers in various industries, including the laundry industry and the garment industry, two very difficult industries to have to work in. We have been fighting for over 100 years to stamp out sweatshops. But today, we have some positive news. Because of international pressure, Phillips Van Heusen, better known as PVH Corporation, one of the world's largest apparel companies, whose brands include Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, Van Heusen, Izod, Arrow, and Bass, have announced a landmark agreement on fire and building safety. For the very first time, a large apparel company has agreed to a legally binding enforceable fire and building safety program, and what is also is equally important, they have committed over $1 million to fund that program. This is a very important breakthrough, but the program will only go into effect when at least three other well-known international brand owners sign on to that agreement, so we have some work to do. But you can help as well. You can help pressure these companies that are on, sitting on the fence, like The Gap, by signing a petition. And I would ask you to remember this short website, www.laborrights.org. We need to remember and make note and be proud of ourselves that the only reason that that agreement was reached with that company is because of the work of organized labor and because of the work of all of you for 101 years. Those companies did not come to this agreement. They did not offer a million dollars because they wanted to. They did it because they had to. Because all of you with organized labor made it clear to them that they would pay one way or another, and it was better to pay now and do it the right way in support of workers. All of you made that happen in the memory of the women who died at this fire, and that work needs to, and I know coming to this event year after year, will continue not just in our five boroughs, but across this state and across the country. And for that, I thank all of you so very, very much. And as we remember and pray for the memory of the women and their families, we should be energized and deepen our commitment to move forward. So thank you all very, very much. This fire galvanized a nation. Enough is enough was repeated and change was called for. The union's membership grew. We fought for better working conditions and pressured the government to pass the labor laws and the fire safety regulations that continue to protect us today. But in 2012, much has changed. There are forces gathered together now in this country designed to push us back beyond 100 years ago and reverse all of this legislation and all of this protection that blood was spilled for on these streets and around this country. Around the nation and all over the world, workers are needlessly dying because their employers put profits over people. Today, we will hear from a worker in industrial laundry on Long Island. This workplace is far too similar to the Triangle Fire of over 100 years ago. I worked six years for a company called JVK. 
donde somos tratados en una manera, um, podría decir, muy terrible. Where we are treated in a terrible fashion. Um, donde trabajábamos hasta 12, 13 horas y no se nos paga ningún overtime. Where we worked 13, 14 hours and we were not paid overtime. Éramos obligados a trabajar uh, de 12, 13, 14 horas. We were forced to work 13, 14 hours. Eh, la compañía es de una laundry donde se procesa a uh, cientos de libras de ropa de hospitales. This is a laundry in which hundreds of pounds, thousands of pounds of hospital linens are processed. En muchas ocasiones no teníamos ni siquiera tiempo para ir al baño. In many occasions we didn't have even a bathroom break. Todos los compañeros somos intimidados. All the workers are intimidated. Pero después de seis años de yo laborar en esa compañía, but after six years of working in this company, yo dije basta. I said enough. Tenemos que hablar. We have to speak up. I'm going to play teacher for a moment. When this tragedy happened, the root cause of it was greed. Plain and simple greed. The owners had decided it was not cost effective to put in the proper safety measures. And it gets worse than that. They actually made money on the fire. In 1911, I will compare it to this year, the income disparity in this city is greater in 2012 than it was in 1911. And why is that? because of greed. So for the students who are here today, you get the day out of the classroom. It's not freezing. But I want you to remember that if we want to have a better society as we move forward, we always have to fight. We always have to stand up because those who live by greed will never stop. And the only way they back down is when we stand up as a community as one and say we want a good life for everyone and we will not deal with your greed and avarice. One person that I have to acknowledge that I think has been here more times than me, all right, and that is Vincent Maltese, president of the Triangle Shirtways Fire Memorial Society, who has been coming to these events for more years than I'm sure that even he remembers, and we're certainly glad to have you here, Vince, and all of the members of the families representing victims of this tragic fire. Good afternoon. I'm Diane Fortuna, the great niece of Daisy Lopez Fitzy. She was born in British Columbia, and she had been injured in the Great Kingston earthquake of 1907. With the reparations paid by the Red Cross for her injuries, she and my grandmother came to this country. By 1910, my grandmother was in nursing school at Coney Island, and Daisy was living in a boarding house south of the village. She married and was a bride of 10 weeks. Daisy Lopez Fitzy never came home from the Triangle Factory fire. 146 people died, most of them immigrant girls. Two weeks after the fire, there was a solemn funeral procession in which 100,000 people marched and 300,000 people watched in a driving rain. Between 1911 and 1913, 60 laws were enacted affecting wages, hours, sanitary conditions, and workplace safety regulations that still are in place in this city and across the country. Many workplace protections that we take for granted today, exit signs, fire escapes, emergency lights, unlocked stairwells, fire alarms, they all came about because of the work of each one of you, because of the work of the labor movement, and unfortunately because of this tragedy. Today, millions of workers are safer, all because of the strong workplace reforms that unions, concerned citizens, and of course our elected officials who fought and came together to implement over the last 100 years. 
Health and safety laws, they save lives. That is a simple fact that we have come to learn in this country. Last year, 2011, the fire department issued over 9,000 violations and summonses for fire prevention related issues in buildings and occupancies throughout Manhattan. And we in New York City labor and forever set time aside on this day for remembrance and to educate and to continue fight for safety and for the health of each and every worker in this country. Thank you so much all. The Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition is a grassroots group formed to help the centennial commemoration of the event and create a permanent memorial. Following on last year's great success, the coalition announced the creation of a Triangle Fire Open Museum and the progress of the permanent memorial dedicated to the Triangle Fire. We are very excited to bring to you the kickoff event for our Triangle Fire Memorial Design Competition. And it's going to be an open call, just to give you a brief uh, description about the project. It will be an open call for not only architects, but artists, fashion designers, graphic designers, um, engineers, if you're out there. This project is going to give the opportunity for that special person to um, come up with an intriguing solution that's going to commemorate these these people that passed away so long ago. Online registration is going to go from from April through this summer. We're working on a stellar jury right now um, that will be posted online. Like I said, at rememberthetriangle.org. I challenge everyone to challenge your friends, yourselves, to submit something. Um, I think we're looking for the next big memorial superstar. This is such a unique op opportunity to create this vertical urban memorial. Uh, it's in New York City. Thank you so much. I have the distinct honor to introduce Ruth Servel, who is the founder of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition, and in fact, the force behind our being here. It's so rare that a tragedy will happen and the building, will, the edifice will still be there and it's still here, one block east of Washington Square Park with thousands and thousands of students walk by every single day. And NYU is being our true partner in coming together to create this. And I really think it's gonna completely change and redefine uh, the lens with which we see the Triangle Fire and what people think is possible. We don't see memorials to women workers. Women are invisible, our work is invisible, labor is invisible. I think this moment now in our country is very similar. Something is happening and I think we all feel that. Uh, the economic divide is so profound and there's so many people who are really, really struggling in ways that they should not have to struggle. People who've worked all their lives and should be okay and they're not okay. You have to just kind of uh, laugh with your friends when they're coming back and saying they've been laid off or they've accepted some part-time job that has no benefits, no health insurance, no pension, as if we don't really care what happens to their bodies, to them in old age. The coalition was founded in 2008, and it's been primarily run by people working as volunteers, people who've been working phenomenally hard for four years now, uh, with very little money. We have done everything we've done, <laughs> and we need help. We need help so that the people who are working, who've been working for four years, can afford to continue to work, to get to the point of having that design. So I want you to contribute tonight. I want you to contribute to zero. I want you to like, when you're writing that check, add a zero. What the heck? Last year, uh, as Marianne said, we started the Triangle Fire Open Archive, which um, Ruth came to us and said, these people are posting incredible things on our Facebook page. They can't become the property of Facebook. So the Triangle Fire Open Archive, as many of you know, is a website, uh, it's an online archive where people have contributed um, personal objects that tell the story of Triangle, not only from the point of view of what happened in 1911, but also why it's significant now. We have the beautiful photograph of Rosie Wiener over here. Um, 
We also have uh, uh, signs from the Wisconsin protests last year. Um, we're hoping to get some of the Occupy signs into the Triangle Fire Open Archive, right? I think one thing we thought last year was it's great now we have over 200 objects in the Open Archive. And they exist online. Thank you. Um, and they exist for a, a, a wide audience of people. But one of the things we also wanted to do was um, make sure that these objects weren't just something that existed virtually. These are real, tangible things that people really cared about. And they gave it to us. And we feel a big responsibility for doing them justice. If, if you know people who are connected to the fire, if you know people who are connected to unions, labor rights, women's rights, immig immigrant rights, we'd love to collect those things still and keep growing the archive. But we're going to definitely, with the coalition, push to create more and more projects like the Open Museum where we really take these things that people have given us with a lot of care and attention and put them out into the world so more and more people can at least start having the conversation about why are these things still relevant and why are they important today. Well, that's it for this episode. From April 26 to 28, the Calandra Institute will hold its annual conference, Reimagining White Ethnicity, Expressivity, Identity, and Race. For more information, contact the Calandra Institute at 212-642-2094 or visit our website at www.qc.edu slash Calandra. On May 5th, at their annual luncheon, the National Organization of Italian American Women will bid farewell to chair and founder Dr. Eileen Riotto Sairi, who is retiring after 37 years. For more information, go to Noyau's website, www.noyau.org. Thanks for watching. For Italics, I'm Lucia Grillo. See you next time. Or as Dean Anthony Tamburri would say, Arrivederci e alla prossima puntata. What is it, Mr. Bernstein? You're going to find me again? How much is it this time? Ten cents for talking? Eight cents for laughing? How much for breathing? That's right, Mr. Bernstein. I talk, I laugh, I complain. I'm Sarah Saracino. I'm gone on AC. And I'm tired of being chained to this machine. I should have listened to Bertha Kaczynski. I should have joined the union. But I was afraid. I didn't have her courage. I take my hat off to the women who joined the union. And they never 